Hello, everybody. My name is Aaron Canole, and welcome back once again to another edition of the Movie Battleground. We are back here tonight on this fine evening to bring back two gentlemen who are certainly some of the top competitors we have in this league, but they're both kind of coming in from a similar position, and that is off the back of a tough loss. We have a very friendly competition as well, Chad Webb versus Will Cohen tonight coming into this. Uh, Chad, of course, is coming back in here off the back of a loss to myself. There's no easy way to say that. It just is what it is. Uh, Will comes in here off the back of a loss to Austin Howell uh, in what would have won him a number one contenders match. Again, Austin has taken full advantage of that opportunity, so there's no way to feel bad about that. But both of these guys are, are great competitors uh, who are looking for sort of that rebound opportunity here tonight. I, I just kind of figured who better to play each other than two guys in that same position who get along with each other. Because at the very least, this is going to get either really, really ugly or going to be really, really friendly. I don't know. So let's find out. Uh, introducing the first opponent of this evening, coming in with a record of five wins, four defeats, and one knockout. He is the virtuoso Will Cohen. Will, welcome back to the battleground, sir. Uh, yeah, as we said, obviously, your, your match against Austin uh, didn't go the best. Uh, if it makes you feel any better, you technically held up better than Henry, who got knocked out against him. Uh, so true. there's positives to take from all of this. Uh, how are you feeling going into this matchup now tonight? You know, I feel fine. Uh, at this point, uh, I kind of feel like I'm just playing with house money right now. Uh, you know, if, if I lose, I'm at 500 with a knockout. That's not, that's not horrible. It's not. But if I win... I take out a competitor who, a lot, you know, who is really, really tough, who does his studying, and who, let's just face it, he has actually wanted to play me multiple times in a regular match uh, ever since uh, some of the just very, very strange uh, exhibitions we've played together. So uh, I, I told I told him I would be on my best behavior, but... Uh, you know, we 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 don't really know what's going to happen one way or another. Uh, there's a, there's always a surprise going into everything, and so I'm just here to have fun. I hope Chad is here to have fun, and uh, let's just do this. Absolutely, very well said. So I'm going to go ahead and sit you in the back along with your son's toy. I'm presuming, or is it yours? And I just assumed incorrectly. I'm sorry. What are you talking about? Oh, okay. All right. Well introducing his opponent coming in with a record of six wins four defeats matching the blazer game tonight he is chad ripper webb chad welcome back to the battleground sir uh how you doing i'm, I'm doing well um absolutely you know, i'm i'm on a losing streak right now um do i want to lose yes. to uh one of my good friends who i call sir william the bloody uh, because of his bloody awful poetry uh i don't think so um, no, but he's doing, he's doing well. He's catching up. Our scores are very, our records, I mean, are very, very similar. Um, he's catching up and today he could take it or I could take it. I think we both complement each other pretty well. And you've seen that in our exhibition matches. I got drunk one time, beat him. And then he came back with a bunch of geek shit and beat me uh in, in exhibition so um yeah, it's gonna be good way to describe it <laughs> yeah so it's gonna be fun to um battle him in a regular uh match just like he said and um see what comes of it the very interesting questions uh i like our answers um and this could go a lot of different ways Let, let's uh let's have some fun and um don't speak of the uh the dinosaur i imagine uh, all right. I mean, we can leave the dinosaur out of it if you want, but okay. All right. Uh, Chat, Will, imaginary dinosaur. Let's go ahead and jump into this. 
Ruby Battleground is a game that is a best of five rounds. It is a first of three points wins the match. Each round of debate is worth one point. If a competitor picks up the first three points in a row, that will be a victory by knockout. And if at the end of four rounds, it is a two to two tie, God help us all. We're going to go to the blind round. Uh, let's all just do a communal prey off screen in a moment so that that doesn't happen, but it may. In terms of the actual debates themselves, you guys have had the questions. You've had the opportunity to prep. Uh, I believe you guys have also both had birthdays since I gave you the question. Is that correct? Yes. Happy birthday to both of you. There we go. I'm not too much of an asshole. You guys get a 60-second open argument followed by a two-minute solo expansion period, a four-minute cross-debate followed by a 60-second closing argument. Backstage, we have three judges in the form of Chris, Maria, and Alejandro. They will join us on screen following the debate, and based off of how you've argued, we'll make the deliberation on who gets the point. With all that said, do you guys have any questions? Are we ready to go? Ready. Let's do this. All right. Let's go ahead and jump into it, guys. And we are uh, coming into this match uh, off the back of one of the most successful months in film history uh, with last March. Uh, we had, uh, I believe it was uh, from late February all the way through, at least as of now, looking at Mario projections, because uh, at the point of recording, it still is not released yet. Uh, seven of eight films are estimated to over hit what they were supposed to make roughly estimating because mario's projections have already had to been raised i believe they're now at about 85 to 90 million in the three day uh, which is a good chunk of change um but a couple of these films have also seen some really odd production cycles uh the uh, very much underseen and understandably so adam driver film 65 had over a year of post-production for seemingly no reason outside of the fact that they got an insane tax rebate from the state of louisiana so they took their time on the visual effects shazam fury of the god of course has had a ton of backstage stories come out about the making of that movie and in specificity it's tie into black adam if you want more on that we had a battleground casual episode a few weeks ago where i dove deep into that so you guys can go check that out if you're curious. Um, and there have been a couple more over the course of the last few years. Dungeons and Dragons, of course, the movie itself, once it got made, didn't have production issues, but it took a long time to get there to the fact that it finally got made. And so it just serves as a reminder that not all film is made evenly sometimes you have some bumps along the way and so the question we have tonight first is which movie in film history had the most troubled production uh this is a different type of debate than we've ever seen but i couldn't think of two guys who are better equipped to make something happen here so let's see how it goes uh in terms of the behind the scenes chad you are the higher ranked competitor so you have the choice of which questions to go first on you chose to go first on two and four which means will you're going to have the honor of going first here in this round uh with that said though guys i'm going to of course wish you guys the best of luck as i go ahead and bring in your timer and will your opening minute will begin when you begin speaking When thinking about Hollywood, there's a lot of, you know, behind the scenes, you know, absolute production hell that's, you know, that's occurred with some of these films. But I feel like the one that really, really hits home as easily, easily the worst of all time is the man who killed Don Quixote. Uh, what's that? You haven't heard of this film? Yeah, there's probably a reason. This film has been trying to be, you know, they tried to make this film for nearly 30 years. When they finally started making it uh, at the uh, at the beginning of 2000, everything just completely went to shit. To the you know, to the fact that two years after they had just scrapped their production in 2002, there was actually a documentary about that production being made and how it just completely fell to hell until they finally were able to make it nearly another 20 years later. This film is just complete disaster from start to finish, and I will expand more in my two minute. All right, that is time. Chad, over to you. Which shit show are you discussing? Sure. If you search for lists for the most troubled movie productions, there's one that is the most consistently talked about as the most nightmarish hellscape of a production, and that's Apocalypse Now. The sheer scope and scale of how troubled this production was has filled books and was the subject of the documentary Hearts of Darkness, A Filmmaker's Apocalypse. The title of that doc aptly describes what went down in the Philippines in 1976. The production would go on for nearly a year, costing more and more money. 
Uh, just like the characters in the movie, Francis Ford Coppola would slowly go insane over the course of the production. In fact, he even contemplated suicide after so many things went wrong. He dug himself deeper and deeper to near financial ruin. He thought he was making a bad movie, and it's a miracle it's as good as it is. Chalk it up to great editing. Coppola's career hasn't been the same since, and he's still shook up about the experience. It's one for the history books of the most troubled film production ever. All right, and I will take that as time. Uh, while these guys take a moment to get their thoughts together, I put together uh, my own couple of fun productions that were just absolutely fucked. Uh, if anyone remembers the Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus, the film in which Heath Ledger died during production, so their solve for it was to add a sort of mystical element to the film in which in certain scenes he's replaced by one of three different actors, all of whom went unpaid for their role. Either that's a whole thing in and of itself. If you've ever wanted to see Johnny Depp and Colin Farrell play the same character a second time, you can watch that movie. Uh, right? Those are both in it, aren't they? Yeah, both of them are in Yeah, okay. Uh, and you've got Jude Law as well. Jude Law, that's the third one. You're right. Mm -hmm. Hey, they all reunited later in that other franchise. Uh, so yeah, that, that's one of them that's pretty fucked up. Uh, recently, if you want to talk about fucked up productions, uh, Blade, which is still yet to shoot, pretty messed up as of now that's a fun one to think of uh yeah i'll try and think of more throughout the round uh, with that said though well i'm gonna go back over to you time starts when you begin speaking so while apocalypse now is definitely the most popular example you know, most famous example of a film, you know, a film that just completely, almost completely went tits up. But the, you know, the man who killed Don Quixote literally did on multiple occasions completely go tits up where they had to stop production, literally. Something that, you know, something that Apocalypse Now did not have to do. Their, you know, their making of production to, you know, illustrate the harrowingness, you know, the harrowing nature of the production of that at least came well after the film. This came before the finished product, you know, the uh, the documentary Lost in La Mancha, which is about the, you know, the killing, uh, the man who killed Don Quixote, the original version, which was going to star uh, Jean Roquefort and Johnny Depp in the main character, you know, the main roles. That came after the film completely, you know, crashed and burned. Set, you know, sets were flooded. Every, um, you know, they, you know, they had to completely recast everything to the point where they finally got Adam Driver and uh, Jonathan Pierce to fill in the roles. The film was completely, completely different. And this film has been going on for so long. By the time it was finally released, no one even remembered that this film was even going to be a thing. So no one, you know, it just kind of went to the annals of time, whereas at least Apocalypse Now, yeah, it may have had a troubled thing, but at least there was a good product to show for it afterwards. So if you want to talk about a, you know, if you want to talk about a complete and utter troubled production, you have to look at the one that for some reason is more famous for the production and not the movie itself. And that's easily the man who killed Don Quixote. Uh, Ter you know, Terry Gilliam, as you know, uh, as Aaron said, seems to be a magnet for disastrous things. It's not quite, you know, you know, while the imaginary and Dr. Pronounce this is not quite as bad, the man who called Don Quixote nearly ruined his career entirely. And time. Uh, Chad, back over to you. Two minutes on the clock when ready. Apocalypse Now was initially supposed to only take four months to film. Filming began in March 76, and while it was actually supposed to be released on Coppola's birthday in April 77, filming didn't even finish until May 77. Production lasted for 238 days. Coppola wanted to shoot in the Philippines because the terrain resembled that of Vietnam, but it was also in the midst of war. Coppola tried to use this in his favor by commissioning military aircrafts to use for his scenes. However, the aircrafts were in a constant threat of being fired upon, putting the entire production in danger. At a moment's notice, the aircrafts would be called away for combat, leaving them unable to shoot for an extended period of time. Then, 
A typhoon hit, destroying 80% of the sets and setting back the production by eight weeks. There was a ton of acting problems as well. Harvey Keitel had to be replaced as the lead actor in the middle of filming because he wasn't right for the role. Martin Sheen would get crazy drunk and injure himself while filming. And, oh yeah, then he had a near-fatal heart attack. Marlon Brando was the worst, though. He nearly backed out of the project entirely, threatening to keep the $1 million the production paid him. When he finally showed up, he was overweight when he said he would be in better shape. He didn't know the script, the book, or his character. He insisted on having Coppola discuss the character with him for days, costing the production time while not filming and money since Marlon was paid by the day. What a goddamn diva. Years after Francis Ford Coppola went insane and became a shell of what he once was, Terry Gilliam tried to make a passion film. He spent years developing it, but the actual production he had in 2000 only lasted for a couple of weeks. Thankfully, they figured out things weren't going their way after just a few weeks and canceled before they cost themselves more time and money. Then, later, Terry got his film, his, he got his film made. Coppola got his film made too, but at what cost? Instead of canceling like Terry Gilliam did, he insisted on putting everything he had into this so they could venture into 230 Days of Hell, a true filmmaker's apocalypse. And time. All right, we're going to go into the four-minute open discussion round. The timer will start back up when the first competitor speaks. I don't think I have to remind you guys at this point how it works, so have fun with it. I mean, first of all, you said uh, that it, your film is more po popular for its production issues than the film itself, but you also said that you've ne that most people have never even heard of this movie. So I don't. Most think people haven't heard. You know, most people didn't realize that the finished product came out. Yes, that is absolutely correct. I don't think anybody has heard of this at all. But people have. Heard, you know, people have heard of Lost in La Mancha. They have heard of Lost in La Mancha. They've also heard of the documentary Hearts of Darkness. Uh, more people have heard of my documentary than have heard of yours and have heard of your production. Um, and that means, go ahead. Uh, and yet, the reason why people know about your documentary is because of Apocalypse Now. Yes. The reason, you know, but because why your documentary came out after that, you know, that film was released and had multiple cuts released after that. Whereas my film, the, you know, the reason why the documentary even came out is because they were making a behind the scenes documentary and decided to release that footage as, you know, as a, you know, a oh, way I of mean, telling the world how disastrous this, pro you know, this project was to begin with. And that's why people know of Lost in the Mancha and don't even realize that has anything to do with, Don, you know, the man who killed Don Quixote. Yeah, but that is exactly the same thing that happened with mine. It just came out a little bit later. It was Eleanor really, uh, Coppola, trying to make a uh, a production film, and then she was like, "Okay, I'm capturing a lot of like really crazy shit." But really, when I go, when we get down to the nitty gritty here, the thing about yours is yours took about the same amount of time as mine had when the typhoon hit in uh, the Philippines. Except, except you're completely disregarding the entire post, you know, the entire pre-production cycle, which actually started in the 1980s. So therefore my production, my film had a longer time to sit in gestation before it was completely canceled altogether. That was just a long time of Terry Gilliam writing a movie that has like nothing to do with the actual production. They, you know, there was that, you know, there that was actually, Terry Catholic, Gilliam there was actually trying to write and rewrite. There's Terry Gilliam trying trying to get funding for which he couldn't do because he wasn't as respected in Hollywood. When the actual production started, it was like two months. They were like, oh yeah, we can't do this. And then later on, they got the movie they wanted made. And I would take that over 200, like nearly a year celebrating birthdays over trying to get this thing made, having so many uh, cast and crew in constant danger in a war zone. And it's the madness of Coppola driving this force, like saying, no, I'll mortgage my own home. I will put everything at risk to get this thing made. The madness of Coppola that would make that thing go on forever if it had to. Thankfully, it only took a year. Except the, man, you know, except the madness actually plays into, you know, Apocalypse Now. So you actually, sure. you know, so it actually feels that, you know, sorry, you actually feel that chaos because it brings up the chaos of war. Whereas my film, you, you know, the reason why, it even, we even got the product that it was, which Terry Gilliam has gone on record and said that he's actually not a fan of. And a lot of people know that they're getting a, you know, they're getting a much inferior product than what they were originally going to get is because of the disaster and the bad luck that this film ever had. Yeah. It had a even bit, you know, you want to talk about 80% damage of a typhoon. This had all of their sets deaths, you know, completely destroyed from a typhoon. Yeah, had they had a lot more sets in Apocalypse now, though. It doesn't really compare it. 
you don't know you know you don't know how many you know sets and honestly and you don't know how uh, his original 2000 film would have turned turned out it that i saw, except I saw lost in the mansion and i can actually tell you it would have been a great film had he actually made it screenplay if he made a bad screenplay and he couldn't replicate that later give, getting like great talents like did, adam driver that's it doesn't Francis matter Francis copeland knew exactly what he was getting in with matter. when he hired that cast and when he tried to do everything that he did so it, anything that he you know anything that went wrong is obviously on his shoulders where Terry, you know, Terry Gillian tried something and it just absolutely failed under him. And that is time. All right, we're going to go into the one minute closings. Will, you are back up first. Time starts when you begin speaking. Crazy Diva actors said, you know, you know, uh, production design going, you know, going over budget, trying to utilize things that are going to put, you know, put their cast in danger. This is all the machinations of one guy who made some bad decisions. Francis Ford Coppola made some bad decisions with Apocalypse Now, and that's who's, you know, that's where you can easily put things. Whereas with Terry Gilliam's, you know, the man who killed Don Quixote, everything was against this film from day one. It took him, you know, it took him years to even write the script. It took him years to get funding. And when he finally did, everything went to hell. Cast, you know, cast, you know, cast members just went away after a long time. Their entire set was completely destroyed. Fun, you know, funding completely disappeared. And yeah, of course, they were just going to, you know, cut, cut and run away. But it took this film almost a full 20 years later to even come out with a brand new cast. And by that time, no one even remembers it except for the documentary Lost in Mancha, where it's a documented failure. And time. All right, Chad, you have the final minute when ready. Honestly, I've never heard of either of your things, and I've never heard anybody talk about them. Um, Terry Gilliam is also at fault for a lot of his own thing. He took forever to write a script and get funding. He wasn't respected in Hollywood. And then when he finally went to go and uh, make this movie, he decided to cut corners, shoot it in England, not even look that there was a military base nearby or anything else that could have potentially like destroyed the things. He didn't have a plan B. You know, Francis Ford Coppola also didn't have a plan B. He had a lot of like really poor planning as well. But I would take... Uh, just, you know, eight weeks of like, oh, yeah, actually, we can't do this. I'm going to go make a bunch of other movies and then make the movie I, I wanted my passion project later over these 238 days of hell, putting all the cast and crew um, through through all this stuff, a, a, experiencing like a typhoon where someone could have died. Like this isn't just a regular flood. People could have died and that would have been like really crazy on it. The finished project product doesn't really matter um, that Apocalypse Now is good. Francis Ford Coppola's career nearly ended after that. And he hasn't made anything great since. All right. Guys, a solid first round there. I'm going to go ahead and sit both of you in the back, and I'm going to bring our judges in. Uh, there's nothing really to fact check here. Uh, I was looking a lot of it up as we were going, but they were pretty factually correct on all their research, so there's no point in bringing all of it up. They said what they needed to say. Uh, so, Chris, I'm going to go to you first. As concise as you can get it for me, who gets your vote, and what was the main selling point? This was an interesting debate. Um, a lot of things I didn't know about. I learned from it today, but I went... But it's Linda Mod just because Chad, it's Chad. He hit it very hard for me to the end with like talking about how much disruption his movie had. You know, why, uh, you know, well had his movie, you know, the movie that shut down and it went back to Panther Project, just for Nightmare from Hell, but directed to the tycoon and everything. So Chad won it, but it's Linda Mod, especially in the closing argument. All right. Uh, Maria, first off, I always like to say when it's somebody's first time, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Uh, so I'll go down to you next. Who gets your vote and what was the main selling point? Well, I listen, <clears throat> excuse me, I listened to both with interest. I know a little bit about the Apocalypse Now situation just from history and watching the movie. I did, I've never heard of the movie that uh, Will was defending, nor did I ever hear of that uh, documentary. So I have to agree with Chad that um, it's not in the same category, nor is it in the same category. Uh, genre of uh, disaster films that I would have ever heard of. So I'm going to give the points to Chad because I think he had a compelling argument and he also was able to uh, bring up lots of points about Terry Gilliam's film that uh, Will was not able to do on the reverse. So my point to Chad. 
Okay, all right. Uh, Alejandro is here with us. Uh, he has, uh, fortunately, uh, has to remain off screen for the match, but Alejandro's there. He's waving at you, I'm sure. Uh, we'll hear from him next round as I go ahead and put the judges in the back and bring in the competitors. As we'll go ahead and jump into question number two here. Uh, and uh, this question, uh, I don't really have a natural setup for this question outside of the fact that uh, I gave it to you guys. And we're going to talk about some damn good films. The question is, what is the best film directed by Curtis Hansen? And your next question is, who the fuck is Curtis Hansen? What well, you're going to find out, because in my own honest opinion, his two best films are about to get talked about. So let's just get into it. Chad, you are up first. The timer will come back up, and it'll start when you begin speaking. Curtis Hansen is a good filmmaker. He's made some good films, but he only made one masterpiece. It's called L.A. Confidential. It garnered a 99% on Rotten Tomatoes and a slew of nominations from the Academy. In fact, it won Best Screenplay and Best Supporting Actress. It would have won more had it not gone up against the behemoth that was James, James Cameron's Titanic. Curtis Hansen was nominated for Best Director for this film, and it was up for Best Picture. Reason being, everything in it is perfect. It won Best Screenplay because the story is fantastic. Boasting a great mystery with great characters and themes of police corruption, it lends itself to multiple viewings. Even though it takes place in the past, it's still relevant, even today. The performances are all next level, with actors bringing these rich, complex characters to life. All the technicals for this are amazing, too, because it looks and sounds amazing, transporting us back to 1950s Los Angeles. Unfortunately, since corruption in police departments and most other institutions will always have corruption, L.A. Confidential will stay relevant and stand the test of time. All right, that is time. Will, back over to you. One minute. So when I think of the best film from Curtis Hansen, uh, I think of the one that is easily, you know, you know, one that's easy to watch, easy to rewatch, uh, and the one that really does kind of stand the test of time. Uh, I went with Eight Mile. The reason why I went with Eight Mile is simple. It's an underdog story. It's a it's a story, you know, it's a story from the perspective of one of uh, the time period's most under, you know, misunderstood artists, we'll say, in Eminem. Uh, he had a lot to do with the production. Curtis Hansen wanted to essentially make his story, but what could have easily been another cool as ice, which a lot of people thought it was going to, turned out to be just a powerhouse performance from both, you know, from Eminem, all the supporting cast, and really a truly master, masterful film from Curtis Hansen. And time. All right. Chad, back over to you. Two minutes on the clock. Um, yeah, I'm actually a fan of uh, 8 Mile. I was a big Eminem fan back in the day. I think the final rap battle sequence is incredible with B-Rabbit calling Anthony Mackie Clarence. Uh, it's insane how different the movie is from mine, which shows the talent of Curtis Hansen. I think this is a really good movie that got the win it deserved, best original song for Lose Yourself. It is not as good as LA Confidential, however. You get some... Uh, you get some character stuff between the two big rap battles in eight mile, but it's just a meandering film that feels like it's not going to actually go anywhere until the very end. Uh, whereas in LA confidential, you are hooked with this mystery component that engages all of the characters. Each character has something different going on, fleshing them out. So you know how to feel about them. Characters in eight mile, not named B rabbit really get the short end of the stick. They're either not well written or just don't really have that mu much screen time. I get that it's a character study, but it just studies the one character, whereas LA Confidential is a character study for multiple different types of characters. They're all interesting, with Kevin Spacey trying to publicize his job as a cop, or Guy Pierce selling out his coworkers from promotions, or Russell Crowe, who wants to be a good person and stand up for abused women, but he gets caught up in the toxic system and ends up hitting his uh, love interest. Um, and then feels like terrible about it. And you just, you know, you kind of feel for him. Um, unfortunately, if you don't really know or care that much about Eminem, 8 Mile isn't really going to hook you in. It's not well written enough to make you care about most of the characters. It relies on your connection to Eminem. Therefore, it's very likely to be forgotten as Eminem becomes more and more irrelevant. 
LA Confidential hits the ground running. It doesn't stop. Its pacing is perfect, hence the fantastic writing and direction. The film promotes a lot of great discussion, but it's also a perfect noir crime film, one of the best of its kind. And that's why, you know, when you go and you look at the police corruption and you can see it all around you, this film explains why people would go the way that uh, they go. It's not it's not an excuse, but at least you can watch this and understand it more and help to change things. This is a great film. And time. All right, well, back over to you. So when you think of the best film from anything, whether it be from a director, actor, whatever, you always have to consider legacy. LA Confidential, yeah, it is a good movie, but let's look at the legacy. It's not, you know, it's not the best noir film that came out around that time. That would be Memento. Guy, you know, which also speak, you know, starred Guy Pierce, for, you know, who was also in LA Confidential. Uh, Russell Crowe would go on to do much more amazing films in Gladiator, Beautiful Mind, and go on to have a much more flourishing career after this when he was essentially kind of sidelined as, a, you know, as this rough and tough guy, which Russell Crowe is kind of a rough and tough guy. You have Kevin Spacey, who, well, let's just say that he went on to win the Academy Award for something else, and then let's just not talk about anything else that Kevin Spacey has done. And Kim Basinger, after winning the, you know, after winning the Academy Award here, would go on to be in a little film, oh, what's it called? Oh, yeah, Eight Mile. So all these actors within, with that were in here were much better served in other films. You want to talk about meandering? Uh LA Confidential is two and a half hours long, and it definitely meanders out points. I try and stand up for this film sometimes, but no, it's a little over long. Whereas LA, whereas uh, Eight Mile is an underdog story. Whether you don't know anything about Eminem or not, you can still look at the city of Detroit, who, which is a character unto itself. The underground rap scene, which is a, you know, a character unto itself. Derek Luke's character, who is you know, Eminem's character's best friend, B Rabbit's best friend. You get to know him really well. You get to know Cheddar, you know, Cheddar Bob really well. You get to know all these other characters really well. They're completely fleshed out, and the film is much tighter, tells a much better, you know, much better, stronger underdog story than LA Confidential does in two and a half hours. And that's why Eight Mile definitely is Curtis Hansen's best film. And that is time. All right, we're going to go into the four-minute open discussion period. Time starts when the first competitor speaks. Look, just because mine is two and a half hours long doesn't mean that it automatically just meanders. Um, I think you just said that because no, it just meanders. Because it meanders. Um, no, but it had a it, it won a best screenplay at the Academy Awards, and I'm not saying Academy Awards are the end all be all, but they gave it that because it's a perfect script. It's they a, they, a, gave, they gave it that you know, they gave it that because it's another film that glorifies the you know the 1950s Hollywood, which a lot of film, it absolutely does. It doesn't at all. It shows the corruption within the entire system, the police department, Hollywood itself, like. You know, get, uh, basically, and yet, we're, and, yet we're con and yet we're constantly in this world of actors and actresses. We're con constantly going to all these glitzy parties. We're constantly seeing, you know, the gl they're glamorizing this violence, if anything else. So you're Whereas saying eight, eight mile, yeah, eight mile at least, you know, eight mile at least shows the city shows these characters in the exact light that it needs to be. Whereas everything is just glitzified in LA Confidential. Well, I mean, sure, it's glitzified, but like it's glitzified to like a high level. Like that's exactly what this film gives you is just so much uh, great uh, talk about like the police corruption, the police departments in Hollywood and everything in the 50s. And then it's relevant to today. Eight Mile, it, it just it shows you people riding around um, in cars, shooting paintballs at, at, at police cars and stuff like that. And it doesn't really give you. Uh, more of like Eminem's story or anything like past that. And really, it, you know, you talk about like, you know, you're naming characters and saying, oh, well, it flushes out Cheddar Bob. Do you know anything about Cheddar Bob other than he shoot he shot himself? You know plenty of it. And if you actually right. rewatch the movie, you would know that. I did. But let's, but let's, talk, but let's talk about it. And I was bored for but let's a talk, lot of it. Let's, yeah, sure you were. Uh, but let's, you know, let's look at LA Confidential. Sure. The book, the book was, you know, the movie was actually adapted from the latter half of a much larger book, and they mention a lot of things that go on in that book. You get to, you know, they talk about uh, Guy Pierce's you know, character's father. That entire that entire story 
unto itself is much more interesting than what you know than what is going on in LA Confidential. We well, get to hear we get opinion. to hear we get to hear so we get to hear about all the you know, we get to hear about how this corruption started. I would have loved to have actually seen that in another film. They actually tried to make that film. They want to make that film, but then they couldn't get it off the ground. And so that doesn't we're, matter. We're kind of we're kind of we're kind of left with we're kind of left with an uh, with an unfinished story. The I don't think it's an unfinished story at all. It tells a complete story from these characters from this one, the beginning of this mystery to the end. You get a complete ex resolution. Except you that. Get a complete except resolution that. for all of these characters too. Uh, for Guy Pierce's story, Russell Crowe's, Kevin Spacey. And you mentioned Kevin Spacey being a, a bad person. Of course he is. And you actually get to uh, hate him in this movie and watch him die. Spoiler alert. So, you know, except, he, you know, except, you know, except that he gets a redemption that he, you know, his character. I mean, not sort of, yeah, but, you know, that was before we knew about anything. So let's get to the even, topic. You know, even even if you ignore that, the character um, itself is just a badly written character. And he, how is it a badly you know, written he, character? Just because you don't like Kevin Spacey, but I'm not going to get wrapped up in the whole Kevin Spacey thing right now. I'm, I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about his character itself. The highest level of it. acting from all of these actors. I am shocked that none of them, except for Kim Basinger, got the. Uh, deserves you talk about all these other films sure they're good in other films but they are powerhouse no they're amazing in other films they, they deliver, are, they deliver they are, they are amazing in other films sure they, they're great actors and that's why they're great in this movie if you go and you look at this film meanders you know, so many... too much and that's why they got mired down i mean by you it. can just say it meanders but it's not it's a perfect screenplay it shows everything you haven't given, exa you haven't given one example as to why it is a perfect but screenplay yours focuses on one character and the other characters and actors are just completely left to the side and They're they not. waste great talents like michael shannon is just in like two scenes yeah and those two scenes are extremely memorable no <laughs> and time all right you guys have one minute left on the clock we're gonna go back to chad first time starts when you begin speaking want to list off the other nominations that this thing got it got uh best picture best director best art direction best cinematography best film editing best original dramatic score best sound and one screenplay and supporting actress so like i said you know academy awards not end all be all but it was lauded for all that because it looks great it sounds great it's a perfect screenplay perfect performances everybody is just acting at such a high level i go and i see russell crowe today and then i'm like He's, I don't even know if he's a good actor. And then I see him in that film and I'm like, he has one of the most complex story arcs I've ever seen in a film. He is absolutely incredible in this film. And he makes, I hate him in the beginning. And then I'm like, at the end, I'm like, why do I like you? How does this film do that to me? Where I actually like, you know, an actor that I don't super like that much, um, but a character that I love. It's always going to be relevant because unfortunately it explores very important issues that we have uh, to explore today. Um, and Eight Mile doesn't really have that much uh, interesting to explore. And it's just going to get dated the more and more Eminem becomes irrelevant. and time all right will back over to you sir you have one minute on the clock when ready when the academy awards finally allow eminem to perform the song what you know many many years after the win for best song at the academy awards you can't really say that this film is irrelevant nor you, can you say Eminem is irrelevant. This is a movie not about really, you know, not not just Eminem's character, B Rabbit, but it is about Detroit itself. You don't you don't just see him in these rap battles. You see him in his daily life. You see him trying to take care of his sister. You see him dealing with his mother and her, you know the boyfriend. You see him dealing with these friends, trying to stay out, you know, trying to stay out of the you know the light of the law. You're trying to see, you know, try them just get by. And make their dreams happen one day at a time. LA Confidential is Hollywood giving you know giving a high five to Hollywood, whether it's about police corruption in 1950s Hollywood or whether it's just being glitzy and glamorous. The you know the film is good, but it is not the best. Eight Mile is. And time. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and sit you guys in the back. I'm going to bring the judges forward. 
All right. So just to clean up a lot of what was thrown out there, because there was a lot of quick stuff thrown out there. Uh, so in terms of reception, uh, LA Confidential does hold a 99% critic approval rating with an average score of 9 out of 10. It holds a 94% audience approval rating. 8 Mile holds a 75% critic approval rating with a 6.7 out of 10 average score. Interestingly, though, considering I don't hear a lot of people dislike this movie, it does have a 54% audience approval rating, so that's lower than I thought it would be. Uh, L.A. Confidential did get nine nominations at the Academy Awards that year. I'm not going to read them all out again because Chad just did. Uh, Eight Mile got one Academy nomination for Best Original Song for Eight Mile, or for Lose Yourself, which Eminem did win. Uh, so uh, with uh, L.A. Confidential... Uh, so the adaptation, uh, again, I've never read the book, so I can't speak to the actual adaptation itself. Uh, but what I can say is that uh, Hanson and writer Brian he uh, Brian Helgeland made a decision to adapt the characters, not the story. That is their exact quote. So they sat down, they read through the book, they took every scene that didn't feature the lead three detectives out of the story and then reshaped it from there in order to create their adaptation. Uh, Cause that's how they felt. It, they felt it was better to rewrite the story around these characters than it was to adapt the book straight up. Uh, Eight Mile is based on Eminem's real life. For anyone who didn't know, it's very much adapted from his real life. It's actually the first of two films. Uh, the 2015 boxing film Southpaw is also based on Eminem's life. And at one point, he was supposed to portray the lead character before he dropped out to focus on an album he was working on, allowing Jake Gyllenhaal to take over. Uh, the best friend character in Eight Mile is played by Mackay Pfeiffer, not Derek Luke. Uh, and then, uh, one fun note that I found while doing research on these films is that apparently both of them had or have some form of continuation in the works. Uh, there was, uh, actually a sequel that was set to be made to LA Confidential. Uh, writer Brian Helgeland was set to write and direct the film, uh, with Crow and Pierce reprising their roles and Chadwick Boseman was supposed to take over the leading role from Kevin Spacey playing a new character. However, once, uh, Boseman passed away, they chose to put that film on hold for the time being. Uh, meanwhile, as of January, of this year, Eight Mile is actually being adapted to television with Eminem's real life best friend and television executive producer Curtis Hansen, better known as 50 Cent, being behind the production. Uh, so that'll be an interesting one to see where that turns out. Uh, with that said, though, Maria, I'm going to go to you first. Who gets your vote and what was the main selling point? Um, I listened to them both with interest. I love both these films. I'm a big fan of LA Confidential. I really feel like with Russell Crowe's coming out party, as far as turning the nuance turning into a nuanced character rather than just the what they wanted you to think he was just muscle and meat hands and whatever um eight miles also a film i love i could i could do the rap battle at the end but i won't bore you all with that um <clears throat> I, I have to think the arguments based on whether or not eminem's <clears throat> excuse me film will still be relevant in the future is what i'm really basing this on so i'm going to give the points to chad because he really had some good arguments about why L.A. Confidential, with its completely uh, f fleshed out script uh, that won an Academy Award and made the mystery go all the way to the end and solved it in a way that was, you know, a we were all able to take in. Where well, Eight Mile kind of leaves uh, B-Rabbit up in the up in the air a little bit. Uh, he, he, he wins the battle, but then he walks home. So we don't know what's going to happen with him. So I'm going to give it to Chad this time. Okay. Uh, Alejandro, I go to you next, sir. Who gets your vote and what was the main selling point? Man, this was really close. Um, I knew it was going to be that way when I saw Will and Chad on the card, though. Like, these guys are great competitors. Um, I'm really glad I didn't get to vote on the last one. That would have been tough. But for this one, because I do have to say something, I'm actually going to go with Will on this one uh, for two reasons, actually. Uh, one being he mentioned the runtime at being two and a half hours and eight mile didn't uh, need that much time to tell their story. And uh, second, making Eminem entertaining in an acting role, I think uh, that is a very, very strong argument as to why Eight Mile is a better movie, movie than LA Confidential. So Will's okay. going to get my vote for sure. All right, so it is split one to one, which means Chris will go to you for the tiebreaker. Who gets your vote, and what was the main selling point? Yeah, this is tough. Um, I haven't seen either movie that I've been on my list to see both of them. Um, I went with strangely enough, I, I went with Will Lavelle. I think Chad thought to hook up with just the actors, and I think that we'll do that to advantage talk about how each of the characters have arc, and then it just became a whole like, oh, you hate Kevin Spacey because of the argument, 
I think Will Abra did spend that position really well. They talk about his movie, his acting, his, the, the way the story would tell. And, you know, the, the knock against LA Confidential for the one time I put trying to think help in the end. Absolutely. All right. Well, judges, thank you guys so much. I'm going to go ahead and switch you guys out for our competitors as we'll jump into question number three. And we're going to move over from Curtis Hansen to another director who is uh, nothing like Curtis Hansen, uh, Guy Ritchie, who's having both a great 2023 and a horrible 2023. Uh, last month, Guy Ritchie's long delayed film, Operation Fortune, Ruse de Guerre. I don't know if that's how that's said, but uh, it released Rose in the theaters the after. Daguerre, thank you. After uh, being on hold for over a year for what is the most history context hold of a film ever in that the bad guys had very direct ties to the Ukrainian government. And so they made a decision to edit the film so that those ties were not there anymore, given what's happened in the last year between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, that movie failed horrendously. His newest film, which is coming out this weekend as of upload, so it's not to confuse the competitors, uh, The Covenant is also not looking to make a lot of money potentially, although Jake Gyllenhaal looks like he might give another great performance. Uh, and I think what Richie really desperately needs is to get in with a studio, get a big film under his belt, and get some money back in his bank to sort of earn his way back into making these smaller films. And uh, while his Aladdin uh, was a movie, I think having him make a sequel to that would be an absolute waste. So the question is, if Guy Ritchie were to direct an entry in an established franchise, what franchise should it be? With that said, uh, Will, you are back up first on this one, so we're going to turn it over to you. The timer will start back up for you when you begin speaking. So perhaps I went with the obvious answer here, but I think the reason why it's the obvious answer is because it's 100% the correct answer. I went with the James Bond franchise, and here's why. If anyone actually took the time, like I did, to seek out Oper you know, Operation Fortune, you would see that essentially he kind of made a James Bond-ish film right there. He made it, you know, but he still made it with all of his signature quirks, his quippy one-liners, his just very, you know, very fast-paced dialogue, you know, his just very, very tight action sequences when he has action sequences in his film. And that's the kind of thing that would absolutely benefit, you know, those are the things that would definitely work extremely well with a James Bond film, especially with the down and dour ending that we got with No Time to Die. Uh, it, you know, we need we need a lighter, more fun Bond this time around, and having, uh, you know, having him at the helm would just be absolutely wonderful. And time, all right, Chad, over to you for your pick. I've never been that big a fan of Guy Ritchie, but even though I find his films mostly middling, there are still some of his films that I do like. Uh, most Guy Ritchie fans seem to love his gritty gangster movies, but I like more of his Sherlock Holmes types. Uh, Guy does well with action and comedy, uh, specifically when he is directing duos like Robert Downey Jr. and Jude Law or Henry Cavill and Army Hammer. Because of this, I think Guy should bring back a franchise that basically ended in the early 2000s, but it still has a lot of potential, like the Shanghai series, meaning Shanghai Noon and Shanghai Nights. The Shanghai series may or may not be an unconventional choice, but he's done period pieces, action comedies, duos, and strange characters. All of these things describe the Shanghai movies, and the second movie ends with the tease for a third movie. Guy Ritchie would have an incredible time working with the reunited Jackie Chan and Owen Wilson. A connection exists already, too, with David Dopkin having executive produced Guy Ritchie films and directed Shanghai Nights. Honestly, this feels like stars aligning for Shanghai 3, and I believe Guy is the perfect director to give it to us. And time. All right, we're going to go ahead and go back over to you, Will. Uh, time starts when you begin speaking. It's interesting that Chad you know, chose to use the word gritty when it comes to Guy Ritchie films because really, while the you know while some of the lenses he uses can be a little you know dark lit, there's hardly anything really 
gritty about these. These are always like very darkly amusing films, whether you're talking about Lock, Soccer, Two Talking Barrels or Snatch, or even some of his later works like Rock and Rolla. All of them are, you know, all of them, uh, you know, all of them are usually very bright affairs. They're usually, you know, usually big, you know, big character heavy, you know, character heavy affairs. And this is the reason why I think when he tightens things in, like even when he did with Aladdin, he when he tightened things in and focused on one or two characters, it was even more electrifying than his typical ensemble work is. With Operation Fortune, that's exactly the same thing. He focused on one character and it was electrifying. Shanghai Nights, there's a reason why no you know no one's thought about picking up this thing to begin with. We don't, you know, we this is a franchise no one's asking for. It's been over 20 years, and it's like you know, it's, you know it would be like Rush Hour 4. I know that they're making Rush Hour 4, but does anyone really want it? The answer is no. Uh, whereas with you know, you know, whereas with James Bond, someone has to pick up the James Bond you know franchise. It's inevitable they're going to make another James Bond film. So why not bring in Guy Ritchie, who has experience making these kind of action films, making these kind of great character pieces, and making it fun for the first time that it's been since the Brosnan era, era where it's brightly lit, colorful characters, quippy dialogue, and you know who's you know who's Guy you know Guy Ritchie's muse right now, Hugh Grant. Tell me, tell me, look me in the eye and tell me God, you know, that Hugh Grant would not be the best Bond villain of the modern era. I dare you. You know why? Because he can't. Guy Ritchie is perfect for James Bond. And that's all I can say. And time. All right, Chad, back over to you. Okay, so the movie that I want Guy Ritchie to make in the Shanghai series, I'd like to call it Shanghai Stars because Shanghai Nights ends with Owen Wilson and Jackie wanting to go to Hollywood, having already met little Charlie Chaplin and giving Sir Arthur Conan Doyle the idea for Sherlock Holmes. We could cut to years later. They have established themselves as Hollywood directors and are about to make uh, Roy O'Bannon and the Shanghai Kid meet Sherlock Holmes. We could even get Robert Downey Jr. to return to the role. This would be a really fun action comedy that Guy Ritchie, I think, could actually elevate. Um, Guy Ritchie does not feel like a good fit for a James Bond film. Uh, Guy does not usually work with large budgets unless it's a Disney production, but any anybody can make a mediocre live action adaptation of classic Disney animated film and make money. Uh, James Bond is high level and recently they've been mostly great, but Guy Ritchie is no Martin Campbell or Sam Mendes, especially when the next James Bond will begin a new franchise. There's a higher likelihood it will fail if Guy Ritchie is in charge. Guy does smaller franchises like Shanghai, where the pressure is not as high and there's not as much of a chance of pissing off tons of fans. Since he did the two Sherlock Holmes movies, those have a huge Shanghai series vibes. So we know he could do it and make it fun working with one of the best duos ever in Jackie Chan and Owen Wilson. I think the fun with the franchise would show through rather than Guy Ritchie trying to elevate himself up to a level I do not think he is prepared for. Even if he could hang with the scope of a James Bond movie, I don't think his style really meshes with it. He's more of a, like I said, gritty filmmaker, and even when he did make a spy film, that was a very middling film at best. I think he could attempt to make his version of James Bond, but it wouldn't stack up against some of the best, and fans would be very disappointed. He'd have to start a new James Bond franchise, whereas continuing a franchise that people remember from back in the day, there's a lot less pressure to have. And you can introduce the Shanghai series to a new edition of people, and they would love it, honestly. Um, but with James Bond, yeah, and Hugh Grant would make a great uh, villain, but that doesn't make Guy Ritchie the best guy to helm it. And time. All right, we're going to go into the four-minute open discussion once again, gentlemen. The timer starts when you begin speaking. So you, you, know, you know what Guy Ritchie really doesn't do well with? Meta humor. Every single time that Guy Ritchie has ever tried to do anything remotely meta, it has fallen flat on his face. And you're, you know, what you're saying, what you're suggesting with your pitch is extremely meta to the point that it would absolutely fail with Guy Ritchie helming it. Whereas with James Bond, at least, you know, you, you know, we have never seen him have a much, you know, have that kind of budget before. And why not try with someone who has proven himself to be a great director with British people, with you know, with you know, with you know, with quippy dialogue, with great action. 
Why not try? Because there's a there's a high chance of this thing failing. And when it inevitably inevitably does, like you said, he makes John, James Bond ish films, but he's not going to be able to make a great James Bond movie. You got to realize we're talking about Casino Royale, Skyfall, No Time to Die. These films are like really, really huge things. And he is normally used to making these smaller Sherlock Holmes, uh, some mob movies. And even when he made the Operation Fortune, that's like something in Wrath of of man a lot of these movies that are like movies that people know, don't really care about or know about or you know want to watch wrath of man uh, you know wrath of man was a huge hit but film. okay what'd you say wrath of man was a huge hit but okay no i mean i don't think i don't hear anybody talking about wrath of man except and you're not listening fans. I, okay but, sure whatever anyways but, you know but you know you know but you know what he doesn't do well with humor the last time he tried to make an outright comedy was swept away and the only reason why that was even remotely seen as humorous is how bad the production was. He does great with certain kinds of humor. I'm, I'm not disagreeing with I'm him. Not the kind of humor that you need for Shanghai. Night. Yes, he. Yes, he does. He's perfect nope. for that type of humor because if you look at the Sherlock Holmes movies, he directed Robert Downey Jr. perfectly. Jude Law. They have a lot of the different like quips together and the different. But you're asking. Together. But you're, what you're asking of him is making is taking that you know taking that great quippiness and adding slapstick to that and that's going to be. A magic massive slap well, i mean when you mentioned. have certain things uh when you have owen wilson and jackie chan coming together they'll bring a lot of that charisma themselves we're gonna have guy richie to come to direct a lot of the the action with jackie chan direct a lot of the uh you know scenes around them but he's gonna like ultimately let them go and i think that's exactly what he does it's just like so the you know, so then basically so basically what you're saying is that he wouldn't be directing it at all no, he would be directing it. That's what I'm saying. He would be there. But if he uh, if he has to, if he has to if he has to step aside and let them go, that's not really what a director does. Well, I'm just saying because of the caliber of actors and the camaraderie that they already have from other films. But that's exactly what he would have to do in like a new James Bond thing. Is but he you're, but you see, but you see, would you to all of the different fans and all of the uh, different little James Bond isms? He'd have to try to go like, how am I going to make this movie? How no, am he, I going he doesn't. To he doesn't have. He doesn't have to adhere to anything style. because as you, he doesn't have to adhere to anything because as you said it yourself, he is going to be starting a new. So he has a new and James Bond. He has a new weird. It's not going to be Oops. anything that. Any James Bond fan wants to see, and I'm not. Yeah, talking that's what about people like, said about Pierce Brosnan, and look how that happened. People said that about Daniel Craig, and see how that happened. So just because well, no, I'm not talking because about people on paper. Actor. If you have like an actor that can actually transcend, that's great. Daniel Craig did that. I'm not sure about Pierce Brosnan. I haven't seen many of those. But if you look at Guy no, Ritchie, but I'm going by what I'm actually. I'm not going by the what the actor saying. I'm going by what you said. Is that people you know that everyone had to adhere to these things. The people you know the people who I'm directed, talking about having to translate the Guy Ritchie isms to the James Bond franchise, and that's what. And he's as you're starting from square one, it's very easy to do. He makes his own films the way he wants to. He's not going to go, hey, uh, you know, James, uh, hey, uh, James Eon, how? Uh, yeah, can was, I make this and when he own? worked with Disney, it was very easy to ruin it. In. And it was middling. And time. All right, we're going to go into the one-minute closings. We're going to go back over to Will first. Time starts when you begin speaking. Whether you want to call these things, you know, call his efforts meddling or not, Guy Ritchie has had success, even with Aladdin, where he actually added his Guy Ritchiness to the story of Aladdin. You know, whether or not everyone thought it worked or not, that movie still made a buttload of money. So you can't really argue with success. And with, you know, when you have a franchise that's just starting, you know, at the starting over point, everything that Chad said that, you know, that would be the worry with all the fans. It was the worry with Brosnan. It was the worry with Craig. And as soon as those first films came out, all those worries disappeared. Whereas with Shang, you know, with, you know, with a third Shanghai movie, trying to add, you know, trying to add the guy richiness to slapstick is never going to work. He is not a slapstick director. And he even admitted that the only way to make it work is if, Guy Ritchie stepped away and let the action kind of happen. That's not what a director does. They could put anyone in the director's chair and let that roll. Whereas Guy Ritchie would be perfect for Bond. And time. All right, Chad, back over to you. Final minute of the round. 
I'm definitely not saying Guy Ritchie's going to be hands off with my movie. Of course, he's going to direct everything in my movie. You know, I'm just talking about like the two actors that come together to make these movies are so uh, charismatic that he's not going to have to work too hard to get some brilliance out of them. And he's going to just, you know, have to uh, yeah, be there to direct everything else. Um, he, if he's going to start this James Bond franchise, there is a lot of ability for him to fail with this. And you talk about like the other actors, like people saying, oh, that actor can't do it. That actor can't do it. Sure. But this is not an actor. This is a director and he's helming the first film. Every single film is either 75% or less. Critics do not really care about Guy Ritchie. They don't like him. Audiences don't like him unless you're a Guy Ritchie fan. And he's going to disappoint so many people. With mine, he can bring back a movie that's primed to be brought back to new audiences. And I think Guy Ritchie would have so much fun doing it. And he would just like make it really incredible for everyone. And time. All right. Once again, we're going to go ahead and put you guys behind the scenes and bring the judges back in. Uh, so to clean up uh, any fact checks from the round or things that do need to be checked. Uh, so uh, the first thing is uh, there was a sequel in development to uh, Shanghai Nights at one point. Uh, the, the pitch that was apparently given was for a movie called Shanghai Dawn is what they wanted to make. Uh, apparently, Jackie Chan was pushing for the film to be set in China because they wanted to showcase China in the, same way, in the same way that the previous two films showcased England and the Old West. Uh, the last that anyone heard about the film was in 2016 when uh, Napoleon Dynamite director Jared Hess was hired to direct the movie with the film's writers... Uh, Alfred Go and Miles Millar being hired to write the movie. However, no updates have been given since, with Go and Millar since moving on to work on uh, the television shows, uh, the Shannara Chronicles, and then Wednesday with no word on this movie. Uh, Rush Hour 4 actively is not happening as of this moment. Both actors have said that they've talked to the studio about it and that they would be open to coming back if an idea ever got put forth. However, since Brett Ratner became persona non grata, the movie has not moved forward in any kind of way. Uh, Wrath of Man did turn, give or take, a $15 million profit for the studio, so given in the time of the pandemic, that was considered a success for the film. Uh, Guy Ritchie has directed big-budget films before. His largest budget was Aladdin, which cost $183 million. It also grossed over $1 billion. Now, you can point that towards the Disney machine, but the fact of the matter mm -hmm. is, between this and King Arthur, he has directed big budgets before. Um, with the most recent James Bond movies all averaging around that type of budget. Similarly, most people don't assume Guy Ritchie to be a studio guy. However, one of the many crit you, I call it a criticism or a note of Aladdin is the fact that the movie is devoid of the Guy Ritchie style that you have come to expect from his films. However, many also praised him for competently directing the movie, even with his isms being pulled out of it. So take that for what you will. It was a very mixed reception. Uh, with that said, uh, Alejandro, I am going to go to you first this time around, sir. As concise as you can get it for me, who gets your vote and what was the main selling point? All right, sorry about that. Um, man, this one was tough. I think I'm actually going to go with Chad on this one. Um, not only because his uh, knocks against a Bond movie were really solid, but the main thing was that he made the argument that Jackie Chan and Owen Wilson would bring this movie to life without Guy Ritchie ever having to try. And I do think directors have a way of delegating that. If you have a strong enough actor, just let them do what they're going to do. So, yeah, I'm going with Chad on that one. Okay. All right, Chris, over to you then. Yeah, just a tough, um, both interesting tradition. As someone who remembers seeing Shanghai Night and seeing it, it's interesting it did bring up. But um, I strangely, I went back and forth on this a little bit, but I went with Will to the end. Just because I think Chad fell into the, the trap of saying, you know, that Guy Ritchie should just let the actor do this scene and not threat. I think, the, especially when you're seeing the question itself, like what he would do well. You know, why and well point out he doesn't do Velvet Slapstick humor. We've seen it many times before, but he does brought up, you know, he does Velvet Spy, he does Velvet Action, he does Velvet a bunch of things. And I think his argument, especially, but he's got Villain a bunch of things. And it's interesting, he told me to the end. Why? 
I don't often point these things out, but you will never see a more proven point of how diverse judging can be when both judges point to the same talking point in the argument as to why they were swayed two different ways. You can't get more diverse than that. Maria, I'll go down to you then for the split vote. Who gets it and what was the main selling point for you? Uh, I gave my vote to Jed. I, um, the minute he said that uh, he wanted the James Brown franchise to be more light and funny, no. Roger Moore did that. It felt flat for me. I never liked those movies. If I thought they were going to go back to that kind of style of humor and so forth, no. Uh, I did think that also Chad had a lot of good points about Shanghai Nights. Uh, Owen Wilson and Jackie Chan were pretty good together in that movie. Um, I think it would be great to see another franchise like that. And he made some good arguments about it. I didn't think Will was able to knock him out. So I'm sorry, but point goes to Chad. All right, judges, thank you. I'm going to go ahead and sit you in the back, and we will go ahead and move on to question number four. Uh, sometimes I give competitors questions that I know will challenge them because I want to see what they come up with. And sometimes I will give competitors certain questions because I just want to see two people go to fucking town on something. The question is, what is the worst horror film released in the 1990s? Oh my god, there are so many choices. And even still, I don't think you could guess what these two went with. So with that said, Chad, you are back up first this time around, so I will go ahead and hand the timer over to you. It starts when you begin speaking. Some bad horror films came out in the 1990s. A.A. Ron said it himself, and a lot of mediocre ones came out as well prior to the release of Scream, which basically changed the game. Um, the worst 1990s horror film, though, is that from a long-running franchise. It is the ninth installment of the Friday the 13th franchise called Jason Goes to Hell the Final Friday. No, it's not Jason in Hell. He's not killing a bunch of demons or anything cool like that. It's a lot dumber. In fact, it barely has Jason in it at all, at least not the Jason we know. Fans were angry when they did not have Jason in Friday Part 5. Uh, part 8 promised us Jason in Manhattan, but he doesn't get there until the end of the movie. And Jason Goes to Hell gives us Jason blown up in the first seven minutes, and then we get to watch a bunch of random possessed people killing other people. There's really not much more to it. They spend the whole time talking about Jason coming back to his corporeal body. Um, they're really grasping at straws at this point in the franchise, and it really just feels like a cash grab, and that is the worst kind of movie among a lot of other not so great movies and that is time man you you wouldn't think that that franchise could continue to disappoint people by the ninth entry but you know you find a way well speaking of disappointments let's turn back over to you what is your pick All right, buckle in, kids, because we're on for a ride. You want to talk about disappoint, you know, disappointment in a franchise? How about a sequel that's a sequel in name only? So when Sorority House Massacre 2 was made, uh, it was, you know, it was not only made for basically nothing but beer money, essentially, where they, you know, they used cat, you know, they used sets from old Roger Corman films that the, you know. Uh, barely telling Roger Corman they were going to be using him when he went on vacation. But the filmmakers hadn't even seen the original and only called it that for name recognition. This film is basically nothing but a softcore porn with some slasher elements in it. It is just incomprehensibly bad from start to finish to an end where you don't even realize you don't even realize it's ended until the credits start rolling. Ugh. And time. All right, Chad, back over to you. Two minutes on the clock. If you look a lot at a lot of the slashers of the 80s and early 90s, a lot of them look like Sorority House Massacre 2. Very tropey, very campy. It's part of the norm. The impressive thing about that one is that it was made for an extremely low budget, like Sir William said, but it feels competent actually it feels like a filmmaker making exactly the type of movie they want to just because they felt like it 
Uh, Wynorski had complete control and wanted to add as much slasher tropes, humor, and nudity as possible. William's not wrong with that one, um, which was actually pretty standard for the time in which the movie came out. I don't see that as a bad thing because it was just fitting in. There was nothing out there to elevate it, but it did the best it could do for the time. It was really Jim Wynorski and a bunch of actors having fun, making a good old-fashioned low-budget horror film with a budget uh, a 20th the size of uh, Jason Goes to Hell. Uh, Jason Goes to Hell, like I you know, said, 20th the size, had like $3 million to work with, and they're like, hey, we can turn that $3 million into so much more money by just kind of just giving like the same run of the mill and just like, you know, having like he said mine's uh or his is sorority house uh in name only but mine's a jason movie in name only like jason they throw him away they bring him back at the end they don't give us the hell part that they talk about he goes to hell i guess at the end but they don't really even show that he just sinks into the earth and then i don't know we get jason x uh next time it's very disappointing and disappointed like a lot of the fans just like the fifth one did the sixth one Jason Lives actually has a lot of like really campy stuff in it and, you know, had some a lot of like meta things and things that you could look at and like go like, actually, this is a really fun watch. There's nothing fun with Jason Goes to Hell. There's no characters you care about. There's nothing that you no kills that you remember with mine. There's some actually fun, really funny stuff. When the wife and I were watching it, there's this one character that comes out and he's going to grab a set of keys to give to the sorority people. And then he reaches for it deep into his pants, pulls it out. It's one of the funniest things I've ever seen. And time. All right, Will, back over to you. The fact that Chad would call his Rudy House Massacre to competent uh, makes me wonder if he actually understands what the definition of competent is. Uh, this film was literally written over a weekend. It was shot in just you know the same amount of time. Uh, it was not even going to be called this. It was going to be called, uh, I believe, something like uh, Wazowski's House of Babes until he decided, oh, well, we're going to make it a slasher film now and make, you know, and you know, just throw this title in there, despite the fact he very publicly had never seen this. This film plays like a bunch, you know, like a bunch of people who, you know, a bunch of porn stars got together, all of a sudden decided we're, we're fine with nudity, but we're no longer down to fuck, but we now want to shoot a slasher film. At least with, you know, at least with Jason Goes to Hell, there, you know, you to explore the Jason lore and you get to see why he's so unkillable. Does you know? Does it make complete sense? No. But by that time, do you know? Do any of these big slasher films usually don't with them when it comes to the franchises? Of course not. And here they try to add supernatural elements to Super, you know, Sorority House Massacre Two, but it doesn't make any sense because you're not getting any special effect shots. You're not you know you're not understanding why this guy keeps coming back despite the fact he's dying, 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 dying. It literally ends with, "Oh my God, he's back!" Roll credits. Uh, what happened? These, you know, these girls, you know, these girls keep saying, "Oh, you know what's going to make you feel better? Hopping in the shower." I'm in the shower. Well, why don't we just shower together? This this dialogue is so cringy; it makes me need to take a shower afterwards. This is, you know, this is just the easily the worst that slashers have to offer. I torture people with this film because I want to see them just writhe and you know and make them question why I'm their friend in the first place, where at least with Jason Goes to Hell, at least it had a plot. And time. All right, we're going to go back into the four-minute open discussion. Tom starts when you begin speaking. Dude, I mean, we, we're, we're both saying it. Like, neither of these films are, like, the best of the best that anything has to offer. So, you know, you're trying to elevate, like, Jason Goes to Hell over this other one that is basically the same movie that, like, you know, of of like all of the movies that come out, Slumber House Party Massacre, Slumber Party Massacre, Sorority but, House Massacre, but Slumber Party, <laughs> Sorority House Massacre two and three in the same year. Why is two worse than three? Who knows? They're all basically the same, but you get a fun experience. At least there's a plot in three. At least there's a plot in one. At least there's a plot in Slumber House Massacre. Plots? That's not a part of a slasher thing. What are you talking about? If you're supposed, you know, if you're supposed to care about what, you know, what these people are, you know, why these people are dying, of after a while, like, and yet with your, you know, your, with your film, you want to talk about, oh well, 
this, you know, this scene is absolutely hilarious. You mean to tell me that the scene in the jail where, hey, I need, you know, you want, you want information, it's going to cost you, and he's breaking the guy's fingers. That's, that's, that's extremely crazy. memorable, and that is hilarious. How oh, is this hilarious. Was crack. Come on, that yeah. is hilarious. From I'll push, okay. You say your finger cracking scene is hilarious. I say my him reaching deep into his pants, like, oh, let me get the keys for you. Instead of reaching, which fits, pocket, which fits right into my, you know, which fits right into my point that this was clearly a porno that they just decided to, on a dime, make it slasher. Do you understand how links like slasher films of that era are to like? pornographic films and stuff like that and that's what jim minorsky does oh yeah because hollow uh, because halloween was so have you ever seen it's cabin funny. in the have you yeah halloween had nudity if you look at uh, it's cabin not pornographic in the nudity. if you look at what would you say i said it's not pornographic nudity it, but what, what's the difference the nudity there's is a nudity. big difference what is the difference there's not a difference intention, you know, intention is cabin the in the woods different. if you look at cabin in the woods mm -hmm. it's exploiting the idea of When's the nudity going to happen? Oh, there it is. It's exactly what these movies do. And I, you know, you punching down to a film that was made on extremely low budget to a film. This film was made illegally. It has nothing to do with budget. It has to do with the fact that this film was made illegally. And Roger Corman actually it wasn't to made it. illegally. Roger Corman's wife gave them permission. And then he said, and Roger Corman I'm making, when it was I'm made. making Shorty House Massacre 2 for. Uh, Julia Corman, and then I'm going to make the third one for Roger. And Roger thought it was hilarious. Roger likes those movies, and yet somehow and they're cult classic made? films because Jim Wynorski makes cult classic films. He made Chopping Mall. He doesn't make just pornographic stuff. He makes really good. Well, I don't say really good, but he makes really fun uh, slasher he does, movies. He does. He does make very good. competent films, and this is definitely not one of them. This is easily the worst thing he's why, ever made. Why isn't a competent film to you? It's it has every single thing a slasher film needs. It has a final girl. It has people getting murdered. It and doesn't have a final girl. It has multiple final like girls. It, it, wait, say it again. It has multiple final girls. It has one final girl. No, it has two. Linda, and then the one f girl actually ends up being like I think possessed by the killer. That's uh, the third one, but okay. No, I'm talking about the second one. <laughs> But anyway, no, yeah, I'm that's what there's I'm three girls in that scene, two are alive, one is possessed. Wrapped up in the same kind of stuff, but you saying that this one is the worst of all of those for no and you, reason. And you saying and you because saying that Jason goes to hell, hell. while you know, while you know for Jason the goes reason to hell did. should never have been made. This movie comes after Manhattan, which was terrible, and comes before Jason X. This one just should have died. It, the six, and uh, yet it has a cult following. It has more of a cult following than Sorority House Massacre 2 does. It only has any sort of following because of uh, Jason, and Jason's barely in the movie, so fans hate it. It doesn't matter. You know, the fact that Jason is in there still makes it a good film. Kind of, but not really. And time. All right, we're going to go on to the final minute. Chad, you're back up first. Time starts when you begin speaking. When you go to watch Jason Goes to Hell on Blu-ray and you look up the and you see the director introducing the film, a director's never made anything else, by the way, and there's probably a reason for that. He goes, thanks for buying this movie again. You bought it a lot, but thanks for buying it again. And that's the same as saying you didn't say anything about your film to say why. Oh, this is actually kind of a brilliant film that you didn't really notice or, hey, I love making this film. I really enjoyed it. No. Because he didn't, because it was a paycheck. And that's all these movies were at some point. Jim Wynorski made his for fun because he likes making these movies. He's good at it. I'm not saying he makes high art. He doesn't make like the best of the best, but these are fine slashers that you can enjoy watching. They have all the elements. They have the nudity, like, like we said. They have the uh, final girl. They have the really funny jokes. He made a lot of humor. There's no humor. I know he said breaking the fingers is funny, but that's not a funny scene at all. Me and the wife were like rolling our eyes at that scene, but we were laughing our asses off at the one character. And time. And, yeah. All right, and then we'll back over to you. For all its faults, Jason Goes to Hell actually has a lot of charm. Leslie Jordan in the film, for you know, for alone, just brings so much charm and hilariousness to that. So that when he, we see he and his wife die by their own hands on accident, it is absolutely hilarious. 
possibly for all the wrong reasons, but it's still a lot more enjoyable than anything you will see in Sorority House Massacre 2. This film is just cringe from start to finish. The guys that they hired were clearly just taken off the streets. They can't act. The women that they brought in only were there because they were large chested and could, you know, looked well on screen together. You didn't have just a final girl. You had, you know, you had at least two girls that actually survived. You had the possessed girl who died. And then you had the one caretaker guy who just kept dying, you know, dying and coming back, dying and coming back. He only brings one, he only brings up one character and one scene as the most hilarious thing in there. The only, if that's the only joy that he gets out of that, that should tell you right then and there how horrible Story to House Massacre 2 is. And that is time. All right, guys. Once again, I'm going to go ahead and sit you in the back and bring in our judges. Uh, all right. So to clean up some of the stuff from this round, because there, there was a decent bit to look up. Uh, so the first comment that was made is that uh, Jason Goes to Hell feels like it was made to keep the rights or to some extent that was said. Uh, that's not technically wrong. Uh, the movie was the first film that was produced and distributed by New Line Cinema after negotiating a deal in order to take the film over. And the movie was made in place of the original concept that Sean Cunningham submitted for Freddy vs. Jason. Uh, the movie's original uh, directors, was it was between two choices, John McTiernan and Toby Hooper. However, Cunningham pushed for director Adam Marcus, who had previously helped him with editing on earlier entries in Friday the 13th uh, series to take over direction himself. Uh, Marcus then basically spent the rest of the production being pushed around by Cunningham and new line executive Michael DeLuca. Basically, every time he submitted a new draft of the script or a new writer was brought in, there was some sort of issue with it. They were removed, a new writer was brought in, so on and so forth. Repeat till you make a movie. Uh, Sorority House Massacre 2 was made technically without the permission of lead producer Roger Corman. It was instead greenlit by his wife, Julie. Uh, the movie was, uh, as uh, director Wynorski says, I wrote the script in four days, cast it in two, and started shooting the moment that they left town for a European vacation. Roger only got wind of it after they had returned. The film was produced in seven days uh, in terms of shooting production. Uh, the original title of the film was Jim Wynorski's House of Babes, which was then switched to Nighty Nightmares, which was then called Sorority House Massacre 2, and Wynorski has said that he has never seen the original. The definition of competent is having the necessary ability, knowledge, or skill to do something successfully. I am not to say that neither of you guys didn't know the definition, but in case you didn't, there it is. Um, multiple times, the question of is plot important was brought up in the debate. It's worth noting that a franchise both of these guys then referenced in the Scream franchise is very heavily reliant on its plot, so say what you will about that fact. Uh, the difference between nudity and pornography in film is that, uh, nudity is, is the, or, uh, uh, nudity is just the simple art of being nude, whereas pornography is defined as something that is attempted to arouse you. Case in point, if a scene is meant to try and make you enjoy it in a sexual manner, it is then con possibly considered a pornographic intent, whereas someone just being simply naked is not considered pornographic by nature. Uh, director Adam Marcus, who did do the film, would direct a movie after the fact. He directed an independent film titled Let It Snow following the making of Friday the 13th Part 9. He also went on to write a couple of films after the fact, uh, the most prominent of them being Texas Chainsaw 3D. Say what you will about that. Uh, with that said, though, Chris, I'm going to go to you first. Who gets your vote, and what was the main selling point? This is why I love judging, because this type of ma match is my favorite. This is probably one of my favorites when to judge. Um, I went mostly closely to the end. I went with Will. I see him bring up the production this year, him saying that you laugh. At only one scene the whole movie, that's the only thing you remember that makes the movie better. I think that closing argument really won me over. And jumping out everything, how bad the movie was, dividing the pornography and everything. Yeah, really got my vote. Why? Okay. Uh, Maria, down to you then. Same question. I'm sorry. Chad gets my vote. Um, I feel like I'm on the Chad train that wasn't on purpose. Um, I, I, his arguments were good. He actually had some really good things to say about the Halloween franchise and what how that movie uh, developed and so forth. I didn't think Will was able to dock him out for that, so I'm going to give it to Chad. Okay, uh, and then Alejandro, to you for the tiebreaker vote. Who gets it, and what was the main selling point? This one was pretty wild. They both picked really, really, really bad horror movies. Uh, honestly, I think 
I honestly think that Chad's going to get my vote on this one. Um, the main reason being that you don't go into a movie with the title uh, Sorority House Massacre and expect like an Oscar worthy movie. It's just going to be fun. Whereas Friday the 13th had expectations that it did not meet. Okay. All right. All right. Judges, thank you guys so much. I'm going to go ahead and sit everyone in the back because your winner by a final score of three to one is Chad Ripper Webb. Chad, congratulations on a very good win there. How are you feeling after that? I mean, I feel very good, obviously. Um, I, I got another win. I had to lose to Jay and then lose to you. And then now, you know, I finally got another win. And But, but that was tough, um, I'll say. And look, Sir William, uh, the bloody, as I call him, uh, he's, he's one of my good friends in the community. I talk to him sometimes, quite a bit, actually. He wanted me to wear a pinky ring. I did. Um, you know, I didn't know what to expect with him because he he's the type of guy that'll choose identity as the greatest horror movie ever made. And you're like, where is he going with this? Um, I'm not saying all of his answers were, were crazy this time. Maybe some of mine were a little crazier. I don't know. But this was a really tough match. Uh, we went back and forth quite a bit. Uh, Will actually gave me the, the name Ripper. So, you know, and it got changed to that. It used to be uh, Danger or whatever. Um, so I like this better. Thank you, Will. Um, and thank you for such a great match because, you know, this, uh, like right after, because I'll, I'll say uh, the the one that ended up maybe being uh, a strength of his was the one that I was most confident on and I lost. Um, cut that out if you don't, if you don't want to reveal strengths, but um, does he care? Uh, I don't know. But, uh, but yeah, um, that one, I don't know. It's just one of those things where the ones that I was like least confident in, I kind of, I ended up winning. And then the one that I was like, Oh, I got that one. I got the best movie, obviously. And then like, no, he was able to like, really is every single round he was able to make me think I was not getting that point until, you know, either I did or I didn't, but that's, that's the, that's the level of competitor that I faced today. And, um, you know, this, this guy is going to end up, you know, making a run. I mean, he, he beat John Marr and I was like, he, John's like a, a, a big up and comer. Like he's really good. He's fire. And, you know, Will's oh, here's my, here's my points. I won. And then I'm like, you know, okay, Will is going to come up with something and then I'm going to lose, you know, thankfully it went the way it did, but you know, uh, I don't want to face Will again for a while. Um, even though I've, I've faced him a few times with other people, but alone, holy shit. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, all right. So let's talk about what's next for you in the battleground because, uh, by the time this uploads, of course, we'll be even closer than we are when recording. But for anyone who is not aware, Chad is set to become a father to a person, not another cat. Uh, congratulations, sir. No, jokes aside, congratulations, sir. Uh, but what this cat. means is in order to be a, a good husband uh, to the lovely Carrie Webb, uh, he will be leaving us for the time being. Uh, at the very least, as a competitor, he may make reappearances earlier as a judge uh, and you'll probably see him and in the build up to the birth of the child, because again, we're still a little ways away, but uh, as a competitor, he'll be stepping away for a while. Uh, so the decision that we came to behind the scenes is that uh, in order for Chad to step out for the next few months uh, at a record of seven and four, he is officially the first competitor who is locked in for the tournament that we will be doing at the end of the season, as is customary for Battleground. There will be a tournament with the 16 best players at the end of this season, and Chad, with the record of seven and four, will be locked in. Of course, his positioning is still up in the air. It all depends on how the summer goes in terms of matches, but he will be one of the 16 in there. So, Chad, just final thoughts before we let you go as a competitor for a little while. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, I, I'm definitely going to miss uh, being in there, but you know, it, the, the tournament's a long ways out and I considered maybe uh, doing another match, but then I was like, you know, I don't know how involved this is going to be. This is my first time being a, a dad. So it, it's even hard to call myself that now uh, when I, the next time I play, um, it'll be a very different story, but you know, for now it, it's, it's a lot. And so, you know, I'm, 
I'm happy to step away just for a little bit to give myself some time, but you know, I'm going to be missing it. I'm going to be watching all the matches and just being excited to see all the new players coming in. Cause you're constantly getting so many great new players coming in and then all of the veteran players, you know, doing really, really well, excited to see, especially will um, I'm excited to see w- what he does next because you know, he's, he's going to destroy the next person. Um, I don't, I still don't know how I won this one cause he's, he was so good today. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I'm excited for the tournament. Can't wait for it. Absolutely, sir. Well, of course, everybody, if you haven't already do give Chad a big congratulations, uh, sir, obviously it's a, it's a good reason to lose somebody. We've lost a lot of competitors in the past for bad reasons. This is a good reason to lose somebody for a little while. Uh, nothing bad connected to the show. We've committed no crimes that you can prove. Uh, So with that said, uh, Chad, it was a pleasure having you. Congratulations on the win. And we will, of course, see you in the fall with the tournament. Till then, take care of yourself and Carrie as we sit you in the back and bring in his opponent. And Will, uh, so I have to ask the tough questions here because I know you have a very, uh, you know, Ne'er do well attitude about things, but you know, in an unfortunate streak of games, you've gone from being the guy who pulled off one of the upsets of the season in the tournament to losing three in a row, which is a tough one to take. How are you feeling after that? I feel fine. Yeah. Look, when you the one the one thing that most you know, I kind of feel like most competitors, when they're in my position in the losing position, don't really take into account. Is that you've run this? You've run this match the exact same way with a new set of judges, and the outcome could go the exact different way. Right. Like I've like I've had people watch my match against Joe, and I've had one person say that I would have knocked his ass out, and then other people say that at least would have gone to a fourth round. So, but you know, in that match, I got knocked out. Right. You know. Uh. Whereas, you know, whereas, uh, like, I've had people, you know, talk, you know, watch my match against Sean Hunter, say that that was an undeserved, uh, an undeserved knockout. Maybe they're right. Maybe they're wrong. I don't know. Who am I to judge? Um, well, when you're an actual think, judge, you're the guy. I mean, that's true. But, you know, most of the times when I'm not in the competitor's seat, I'm hosting really, really terribly. But, you know, that's... That's neither here nor there. But uh, with this particular match in general uh, against Chad, uh, I tried to give him the best match as humanly possible uh, with doing literally the least amount of studying I have actually done for a match. Uh, I, you know, around the time that this is uh, right before this filmed, I filmed, I think, five other trivia matches that go, you know, that go against like a larger rank. And so it's like I just crammed and crammed and crammed. So it's like, well, what film? You know, what films are chosen? Oh, all these films I've seen thousands of times. Oh, this. This isn't even a film question. Oh, well, there you go. So maybe I approach this a little bit, a little bit more arrogantly than I typically do. But with that being said, uh, Chad still, man, you know, Chad still managed to you know, outweigh the chaos that I did. He did, you know, he gave me, you know, he gave as much back as I gave him. And so he, you know, he was just there, you know, he was there, he was competing, he was doing his best. And do I think he deserves this win? Of course he does. So uh, I, I guess I just don't take my losses personally. That's fair. It, it's certainly an indifference. I, I think there's a I think there's a level to this. There there there's a, a happy medium between taking it too harshly and not taking it harshly at all. Uh, as a showrunner and producer, it is always great to hear that people are studying for other things more than my show. But hey, I also don't force people to study. Who gives a fuck? Again, Jay Burns made it to a title match, and I don't know if he's ever prepped for a question in his life outside of the blind round questions when he gets time to prep right here in the match. So anything's possible. With that said, Will, we will see you in the near future, sir. Till then, take care of yourself uh, as we go ahead and sit you in the back as the dinosaur has his way with you. Well, he got more of you than he got of Adam Driver. So we'll go ahead and put you in the back. Uh, Guys, with that said, thank you for 
watching. Again, congratulations to Chad for more than one reason, but congratulations, Will. Thank you, of course, for being here as always. Thank you to my judges, Chris Alejandro and Maria, for being here tonight. Thank you to all of you. Please be sure to rate the video, drop a comment, subscribe, and interact with the channel, and stick around for more movie battleground matches because we have a lot of great ones coming at you. And with all that said, on behalf of everyone for the show, my name is Aaron Canole. Until next time, take care.